like is all getting corrected at this point. Um, which is, yeah. good. but I mean, who could have, you know, our president, Michelle DeFeo, we just, we've had um, so many team calls where we're just in awe of where we are right now. We had forecasted we would be down almost 39%, just taking into consideration the on-premise and Absolutely. not knowing what people were going to want to do with champagnes. So it's great, again, to see that people are buying champagne and enjoying it. Like you said, always a reason to celebrate, especially yeah. these days. <laughs> Especially today. Yeah, it's all, exactly, exactly. It's um, we keep like look, looking forward to Q1 next year and like to see whether or not James Bond is actually going to release or whether or not we're going to get deleted for like the third time this time around. Oh my God. Um, we like keep wow. getting like these really big like gear ups for the movie and then it's like, oh, just kidding, we're pushing it out another six months. So, um, do you see a big spike in sales when there's a new Bond? Yeah, and they're actually doing like, um, so they they released a special like limited edition uh, 2011 vintage for the movie. Awesome. They got released now a year, over a year ago. So that's all sold out. Oh. Um, <laughs> and uh, they're doing a really cool special cuvee, um, like a rebrand where they've changed like the, on the, basically on this guy, oh, ooh, it's kind of hard to see with this, but they've like changed the emblazon and it'll say like 007 on it. Um, and it's going from red to black. So cool. hopefully, ho hopefully it gets here in time and, but hopefully the movie is going to be released. Like, we'll see. I just, I keep putting myself in the running to meet Daniel Craig for any red carpet events <laughs> that, you know, if we feel safe about that. So they'll have to just let me know if that's happening. Sometimes well, you don't <laughs> right now, you know, you guys calculate a risk. <laughs> exactly it might be slightly more calculated if it was idris elba but i i would be fine with Daniel <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not sure what the plot line is for this next edition of, of 007 but i definitely think that at some point they need to have a character who's a champagne sales manager represented in the film and i mean Brittany, i think you'd be perfect Brittany. for that so I will I will happily throw my my hat into the ring for that role if and when it finally is approved in their plot lines. <laughs> Just so we're all aware, I feel like I mean, I, you, you get, don't get it if you don't. Right? <laughs> I think we're ready to get started. Fabulous. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the Champagne Showdown. Every year we host the Champagne Showcase in store, but because 2020 happened, here we are. <laughs> I love Champagne. It's my favorite wine of all time, and I'm so fortunate to work at Downtown Spirits, where I have access to an extraordinary selection, and we'll get to taste through some of my favorites today during the showdown. Uh, and that's a reminder, it's not just a tasting, this is a showdown. We have four sets. <laughs> Two champagnes competing for your everlasting love is the best of the best all time ever. All scores are definitive. Everything's subjective and all the champagnes are amazing. Um, but our first two matches are Brutes, Laurent Perrier versus Nicolas Foyant, and then Moet versus Bollinger. Then a wonderful intermission, and then we'll be on to our second set. First two rosés will go cork to cork, Ayala and Nicolas Foyant. We'll finish up with this demisex, uh, Laurent Perrier versus Veuve Clicquot. And keep notes on the champagnes. You feel one each match throughout. And at the end, we're going to have a poll to see who the victors are. Now, we'll move on to introductions. I'm Terry. I'm one of the managers here at Downtown Spirits. I have a huge number of responsibilities, but I think the single most important responsibility I have is for all of the champagne that we carry. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce four of the greatest women who work in the champagne industry. And I will let them introduce themselves. Jory, tell us about you. What was- well, we, we paid him to say that. <laughs> Can you tell us what your favorite champagne experience was? Well, I guess it would have to be going to champagne um, because there really isn't, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to, to uh, translate the stories without actually touching the ground. Um, so I've been representing Nicholas Foyat for the past year and a half, but uh, drinking and celebrating champagne for the past 15 in this business. So Terry, Marcus, thank you so much for having us and I uh, look forward to talking a little bit more about these champagnes. 
Awesome. Uh, Nancy, would you introduce Good everyone? Good afternoon. So happy to be here. Uh, wow, favorite champagne moment is a tough one. Um, it should probably involve drinking some Krug, but <laughs> off the top of my head, more recently, um, we took an RV trip and we were down in Mount Shasta and I had the foresight to bring along a half bottle of Vuglico in the RV. And after setting up a campfire, being able to drink a little bit of bubbly outside during COVID was perfect. Oh, that sounds awesome. All right, Naomi. Hello, everyone. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for organizing this. Um, not only a wonderful excuse to drink champagne during the day on a Saturday, but to get to meet these wonderful women and get a chance to taste through some of their champagnes. Um, I'm the Western Regional Manager for Champagne Laurent Perrier, and I have to say my um, best champagne experience that I can think of right now, there's been a lot, um, <clears throat> but I would say being in Champagne, I totally agree. My very first Champagne trip, I worked for a different Champagne house, Louis Roterer, and I had an opportunity to taste um, 1985 Cristal with Jean-Baptiste Le Caillon, their winemaker, and I was blown away. I had never had a vintage, like an old, old champagne before. Um, and also just being in his presence in champagne, I was godsmacked. So set for a career for the rest of my life. I'm never leaving the champagne uh, world. <laughs> oh, man. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. And rounding us out is Brittany. Yeah, so thrilled to be here as well. Um, I work for Vintis, which is the importer for both Bollinger and Champagne Ayala. Um, like these ladies, actually being in Champagne and seeing, not only seeing the vineyard sites, but also seeing the ties into history um, and all of the, the, the historical value that goes into um, the house style that's being created. It's really cool to see that at work. Um, Champagne Ayala and Champagne Bollinger are only about 50 yards down the street from each other and they could not be different in terms of philosophy and focus. So it was just really cool to see, um, see those comparisons side by side and to be able to see it in person. So I think bubbles are the best thing in the world. And if I could drink champagne every day, I most certainly would. And if I can get one, one person you know, a, a day to, to share my love with champagne, I consider that a win. So hopefully by the end of this, we will have converted all of you to be more frequent champagne drinkers as well. Here, here, here's for that. Absolutely with here's everyone. That. If you get a chance to visit champagne, it's absolutely extraordinary. I was blown away by, um, they have limestone cellars. So way back when the Romans were in that area, they were mining um, the region and then they just kind of left these giant caverns and now it's full of just champagne, sleeping champagne. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and so medium champagne, there's a couple of uh, slides here of terminology that I just want to go over so that we all know what's going on when we say certain words. Uh, first up would be dosage, it's the amount of sugar added to the sparkling wine just before corking. Champagne is a very northern region. It's very high acid and a little bit of sweetness at the end helps to balance it out absolutely beautifully. Next up is cellaring. And um, that's just storing a wine in a cool dark place for years and years. Uh, riddling, riddling regular, uh, regularly twisting the bottles back and forth to ensure sparkling wines remain free of sediment. So uh, there's, there's leaves which the wines are aged on. And in order to get that out of the bottle, um, they're slowly tilted and rotated over the course of many years so that it's an even um, uh, removal of all the sediment. Next up is phylloxera, which is a microscopic louse or aphid that lives and eats the roots of grapes. Uh, it almost destroyed all wine production in the 19th century. Um, and very interesting history behind phylloxera, but we're not going to dive into that today. Next up is vinifera. Vinifera is the style of the grape vines. So there are vines that are native to the Americas and vines that are native to Europe. And most of the time when we're talking about wine, it's vinifera varietals um, that we're talking about. Lees aging, deposits of dead yeast or residual yeast and other sort of particles that precipitate to the bottom um, of the vat after fermentation and aging. And then oftentimes when you talk about lees aging, that's because the wine is actually sitting on those particles 
um, and that gives it a different characteristic depending on how long it sits on the leaves. Method Champenois is a sparkling wine production method whereby wine undergoes a secondary fermentation process um, to produce those delightful little bubbles. And that's why uh, champagne seems to have so many more bubbles than say uh, soda would, um, because it's not CO2 being injected, but rather it's the fermentations happening in the bottle itself, which is absolutely amazing. Next up is Brut, and Brut just means dry, so it's not sweet. All righty, Demisec means eh, it's a little bit sweet. Uh, next up is Cuvée, it's a blend of wines with more than one grape. Um, varietal, so nearly all champagnes are going to be cuvées. There's all kinds of um, blending going on in order to create uh, the exceptional characteristics that we get to taste. Perlage is another name for the bubbles, the fine bubbles, the mousse that comes up from secondary fermentation. And then disgorgement. So after a wine's finished aging and it's been riddled and the lees are, and all the sediment is come to the end of the, um, uh, the tip of the bottle, they go ahead and freeze it, open it up, the pressure inside shoots all the sediment out, they top it off a little bit of dosage and boom, your wine is ready to go. And our last term is reductive. And this is a winemaking style that minimizes oxygen exposure. When it comes to winemaking, oxygen plays a big deal in that. Um, and I know at least one of these ladies is gonna talk about reductive style later. So let's move on to the tasting sheet. And we have a tasting sheet here just to kind of help guide you through um, what you're looking for when you try the wine. So first up, you want to just take a look at the wine, pour it in your glass, see how the uh, you know wine fares against the light or against the black background. Next up, just give it a deep smell. Uh, I can use a glass right here. So go ahead and stick your nose in the glass. Don't stick your nose in the wine unless that's your thing, in which case go for it. And finally, taste it. And there's going to be all kinds of different flavors that erupt across the palate. This is why we have eight different wines to taste. And even though they all come from a pretty similar species of grape, they're all distinctly different. All right. And with that said, go ahead, take your notes as we go through, and let's get started. All righty. First up, it's going to be Laurent Perrier Brut La Cuvée, Naomi. Is. All right, so make sure that when you're tasting, this is the wine that you guys are tasting perfect. Um, so I, um, I'm Naomi Smith, and uh, I am today, through the, the powers of our current virtual world, I'm transporting you to the vineyards of Laurent Perrier. So um, as, as Terry was speaking, if you see the soil, you could just, you can literally write with this on the ground. This is what the soil looks like. Um, uh, and this is one of the 17 Grand Cru villages in the Champagne region is where Laurent Perrier is based. So the winery was first built in 1812 and has been known throughout its history as being a house of considerable quality um, and also innovation. Uh, the first person that I will highlight as a, a main innovator was our first Vauve. Uh, her name was Matilda Laurent Perrier. She took over the house when her husband, sadly, uh, tragically, was killed in a cellar accident. So I love fun facts, um, but one of, the, one of my favorite fun facts is that the cellars were quite dangerous to work in um, in the 1800s. Unfortunately, they hadn't figured out how to control the pressure in the bottle, and they also hadn't figured out how to control or how to build strong glass. So the integrity of the champagne bottles were, was not great. So they would have a problem with bursting bottles. So some houses would lose up to 90% of their annual production. Um, so we lost one, uh, one but we gained a, a veuve and sh she was extremely instrumental in elevating the winery. One of the things that she's most famous for was being um, the creator of the very first no dosage champagne, which is quite popular these days. But at the time in the late 1800s, it was extremely revolutionary because sugar levels were quite high. So uh, in 1876, Louis Roederer champagne created Cristal. It was made on the request of Louis, or I'm sorry, Alexander II, the Russian czar. He wanted a sweet champagne. So it was 100 grams of sugar per liter. 
The British wanted a drier style. They wanted a brute. So they only wanted 60. So for her to produce a no sugar added champagne was very revolutionary. Um, it coincidentally was very popular. It was launched in the Eiffel Tower, which had just been built um, and was very famous for many, many years and went dormant into World War I. The House then in the uh, 70s actually petitioned the CIVC uh, to uh, the government arm of the Champagne region to add a new category to the dosage chart at zero to three grams per liter. And we launched the, um, we relaunched the Ultra Brut when it was created. And it's a very popular one that we still make today. Uh, Segwaying into our second, Vove, another incredible woman uh, who ran our house. This was Marie Louise Lanson. She purchased uh, Laurent Perrier in 1939. She was a descendant of the Lanson Champagne House, which I'm sure you, you may have heard of. She had older brothers, um, but two young sons, and uh, wanted her sons to have a, a winery. Um, she also saw that World War II was on its way and wanted to invest what little finances they had left into the future for the house. So of course, World War II happens. The two sons, Maurice and Bernard, go off into the war. Unfortunately, one did not come back, um, but one did come back as a declarated war hero, Bernard de Nonancourt. If you've ever read the book Wine and War, you will read, you would have read a lot about him. And if you haven't read the book, I highly in encourage you to, to read it. There's several, I think all of the houses, uh, rep almost all of the houses represented today um, are, are featured in this incredible history in the region. Um, one of the things that Bernard was famous for was discovering, uh, being one of the soldiers who discovered Hitler's eagle's nest. So the collection of wine, art, and spirits, champagne that had been stolen from the Nazis. So incredible figure. When he came back, he brought back that spirit of innovation. He uh, transitioned the house to 100% cold fermentation stainless steel. We don't use any oak at all, so that reductive um, term that um, we were discussing earlier. This is our house. This is very important to the house. Um, he also created one of the first multi-vintage prestige cuvee, which is Grand Siècle. So really highlighting the idea of the art of blend. Um, so wouldn't you, why wouldn't your prestige cuvee also represent that? Um, he did many other things throughout his history. Um, in 2005, um, he passed the house on, of course, to his two daughters, Stephanie and Alexandra, making us the largest female and family owned champagne house in the region. Alexandra's daughter, uh, Lucy, actually just came on to join our production team last fall. It's very exciting. She's also about to give birth to her daughter, so maybe a future Laurent Perrier owner down the road. So what you're drinking right now is our live today. So this is this, this is um, <clears throat> a product that is um, from a renovation to our house in 2017, which was done by the uh, specification of our winemaker, Michelle Fauconet, who's been with us since 1974. We also own Salon in Delamont. Uh, so he also makes those wines. So he's a lover of Chardonnay. So with this renovation, he eliminated as much light and oxygen in the winemaking production. We also, at the same time, uh, purchased a Grand Cru vineyard, so we were able to elevate our non-vintage brood. So um, we're, you can go to the next slide, but um, the sapage on this is 55% Chardonnay, 35% Pinot Noir, and the rest Pinot Meunier. Um, we do extended lees aging on this wine, so the rule in Champagne is 15 months. We do four years at a minimum. Magnums of our La Cuvée are six years on lees. So <clears throat> this really represents our house style and it's said that you can really tell a lot about a winery based on this wine that they consistently produce every year coming from four different vintages uh, and yet they make it taste consistent every single time even though the vintages, the harvests are oftentimes quite different. Um, I'm a huge fan of this wine. It really does show the house's um, dedication to freshness, purity, and elegance, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm That's not sure how much time I took. <laughs> Absolutely. Cheers. So, one thing I forgot to mention, the tasting sheet. It's at downtownspirits.com backslash showdown. Mm -hmm. so grab it and print it off. Take your notes. We got it. Posted up there. Uh, fantastic. So Naomi, quickly, what are the primary characteristics you get when you drink uh, LP brew? 
It's interesting. Um, the president of our of our house, Michelle DeFeo, just was on with Karen McNeil a couple nights ago, and it, I I have the things. I get green apple. I get pear. Um, I get um, some limestone. But listening to these two incredible women tasting this wine, picking up things like ginger and and um, lemongrass, it's, it's kind of swayed. <laughs> I'm now I'm thinking about those things, and I'm. Now I'm getting a little bit of that ginger too. So um, it definitely just, what I get from this is an extremely fresh grape driven, um, high acid, not too high acid, but high acid enough where you get some grape um, crispness to this wine. That's definitely gonna come from the reductive style of winemaking. Exactly. Just so coming in for the rebuttal, oh, did I didn't mean to cut you off. Coming in for the rebuttal, it's gonna be Jory, Foyat mm -hmm. Brut. Uh, so I know that yeah, I know Nicholas Foyat was conceptualized from the golden age of Hollywood. What uh, which golden age celebrities do you think best embody the Brut? <clears throat> I do really love this question. Um, first of all, I, I do want to kind of transport you to our facility uh, here in France, which was built six years ago. Um, this contemporary architecture, modern in style, which really plays into the theme of this Not wine. Me. So uh, here is the wine yeah. that we're drinking in this glass. Yeah. And in comparison to my uh, very esteemed colleagues in the room, um, this champagne house is actually relatively young, uh, celebrating the 45th anniversary this year, which is great reason to celebrate, a lot of other reasons to celebrate the end of 2020 and getting into 2021 for sure. Um, the man behind the name, Nicholas Foyat, uh, he was born into a Champagne family. And uh, at that time, they just had about 15 acres of land. Um, he left home uh, to kind of find his own path at the age of 20, 21. This was right after World War II. And uh, his entrepreneurship and his charismatic spirit, which he was very charismatic, uh, led him to the States and actually into the Hollywood circle. So Terry, answering your question, as he, as he found himself, um, he was in his late thirties at this time, he lived in Manhattan, he had this flat and he would entertain some of these prestigious celebrities and some of his closest friends, uh, Sophia Loren, Cary Grant, Lauren Bacall, Humphrey Bogart, uh, Shirley MacLaine. Some of these, obviously, some of you guys recognize these. Frank Sinatra. Now, one. Um, More. <laughs> um, but uh, as he would talk about his background in, in Champagne, his friends, um, he kind of gained their influence on their endorsement. So he moved back to Champagne and purchased 30 acres of land and started a champagne house. And this was when his brand launched in 1976. Um, you know, as we talk about uh, this particular wine in this glass, um, you know, Terry, I love how you mentioned Cary Grant initially because it does have this amazing structure, but one of Nicholas's uh, closest friends, Lauren Bacall, uh, who is known for this uber sultry glow uh, in a very unassuming manner. And uh, she's been quoted and she was just a starlet, you know, coming into, uh, you know, the room of, you know, some, some more established colleagues and, uh, you know, very esteemed celebrities at that time. She would, um, she was, she felt a little uncertain and she would put her head down. And when she came up to speak, that was her, claim to fame, that sultry glow, and just finding that confidence. Um, so this particular champagne also uh, doesn't see any oak. Um, so you'll notice that it does have a freshness and style. It leads with a little bit more Pinot Noir, so you get expressiveness, a little bit of that, uh, a little bit more fruit coming forward, um, but definitely a elegant, complex champagne. And uh, I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I have. <laughs> Thanks for letting me talk a little bit about Hollywood. Oh, I definitely get some of that uh, sultry Lauren Bacall right there on the finish. Definitely. <laughs> oh, fantastic champagne. Terry, do you have any other questions on the taste uh, or details of this? No, I mean, Perfect. 
you took me right through it all, man. It's, um, I just think it's so much fun comparing a bottle of wine to like your favorite actors from back in the day. Um, it definitely it, paints a picture. <laughs> all right, well, there we go. We have our first lineup there. You can decide which one you like better, who won, who lost. We all know that we're all the winners here. <laughs> all right. Uh, so moving on to our second competition, we're going to start off with Nancy telling us about Moet Imperial Brut. Moet is one of the most iconic champagne brands of, you know, our era. Uh, how did they have they established that sort of um, uh, prestige? Terry, that's a great question. The House of Moet Chandon has existed throughout a tremendous period of time. But the interesting, what, I, what really strikes me about how the house was founded was that Claude Moet in 1743, as a rather successful champagne salesman already working for another winery, decided to go off on his own and start a new maison with the focus and goal of being connected with some of the most powerful, influential, um, we'll call them tastemakers of their time. Um, some of these targets were as high as a royal court. So in about five years time, Claude being his cunning, charming self um, did make a lot of close friends, including Madame Pompadour and who was one of King Louis XV's um, greatest confidants. And before you knew it, Moet was really in the social circles of the French elite. But part of Moet Chandon being an icon goes a little bit beyond the being connected to the rich and the famous. Um, something really cool that happened during the Second World War was that the president at the time who founded Moat Hennessy, the company that I work for today, um, was actually pretty instrumental in helping the town of Epernay uh, withstand some of the um, challenges the Champagne region had during the Second World War. The German front was really right at Champagne, and the sellers that are behind me these are the Moet sellers. Um, when I visited, there were these odd street signs that, that were very specific and something pointed to a hospital. So I had asked our, our guide what that signage was about. And it goes back to this, um, this time period during the Second World War. 17 miles of sellers were converted into hospitals, makeshift schools, and marketplaces for the Epernay town. Uh, Moet Shannon opened their doors to the community to try and give them some shelter from the bombings that were going on. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that region has a really interesting history, um, especially how Champagne survived throughout. Um, oh, that's a lovely one. So, like every bottle of Moet, I taste, taste like Moet. Even though the, the what's the production on Moet? I think it's up. It's pretty up there. Um, how considered they, one sure. Their style across such a an vast production. You know that's a great question. I would love to say the answer is magic, but it's um it it was by design. So Moet Chandon happens to be the largest vineyard owner in Champagne, and with that. There are a couple things that are really important. With larger land ownership, it's important to be responsible or socially forward thinking. And with these larger vineyards, they were one of the first to adopt more sustainable practices. And to date, Moet Chandon has reduced um, water usage by over 1.5 liters per bottle. Um, and they're making more innovations in that realm as well. But going back to the consistency, there are 800 base wines made throughout the whole entire Champagne region. Moet owns vineyards as north as the Montana de Rennes, all the way down to the O. So it's quite really that, that whole entire range they have ownership. Approximately 50% of those vineyards are Grand Cru. About 25 happen to be Premier Cru. So when you're sourcing from 800 base wines from across the whole entire region, whenever you drink a bottle of Moet Chandon Brut Imperial, it's really, to me, a compilation of terroir throughout the Champagne region. You get really the best of what grape varietal, um, each spe uh, specific village, what that character really showcases is blended in. So the ultimate blend in a glass, you narrow it down to approximately 100 different individually 
vinify wine. Um, it's a pretty fair representation of the grapes that are grown in Champagne. So about 35, 40% Pinot Noir, um, about 30% Meunier, and the remainder of the balance being Chardonnay. Um, it is quite dry at seven grams of sugar per liter. So the dosage dances towards that extra brute range if it were just a few grams lower, a couple grams lower. Um, but I think, you know, to what Naomi said earlier, Moet Chandon also has a reductive style of winemaking. So in the glass, they really lean on bright fruity notes. They maintain that really fresh quality on the palate. But given that it's about 75% made with red wine grapes, that really uh, soft fruitiness, it gives it a weight on the texture. Um, and I think it has a beautifully well-balanced finish. Can't disagree. Well, I'm going to move on to what you said about terroir. This means kind of the, the expression of everything that goes into a bottle of wine. And it's a nebulous term that's hard to define. Um, and so I'm going to ask the brilliant Brittany, who's bringing us some beauteous Bollinger, to kind of explain what to me is a little bit of a conundrum. Because you take Bollinger, it's the bottle of James Bond, it's the bottle of the Queen of England, how does a French champagne house have such British terroir? Well, maybe not so much British terroir as much as British love. Um, Bollinger has had a long-standing relationship with the British as they've been historic trading partners for centuries, similar to other regions like Bordeaux or areas of port. And the reason that love affair has been going on so long is really the relentless pursuit of quality and consistency for nearly 200 years of Bollinger's history. So the house itself was founded in 1829 in the Grand Cru village of Ai, and they have crafted a house style known for a backbone of Pinot Noir grown from their family's vineyards. The winery itself is still family owned, which is becoming considerably more rare in Champagne. They own 165 acres of vineyards all in all. Uh, so they're both a grower and a producer. Pinot Noir as a grape is powerful yet elegant, and that translates well to the style of Special Cuvée. Um, the wine itself is composed of 60% Pinot Noir, which is the house minimum for any wine that they craft, 25% Chardonnay, and 15% Pinot Meunier. And there are a number of reasons why Special Cuvée is unique. Um, so I know a few of the ladies who've come before me have talked about a more of a reductive style, Bollinger is on the opposite end of the spectrum with a very oxidative style. Um, so their base wine is aged in barrels. They actually are one of few, um, very few wineries across the world that actually have a cooperage on site where all they do is repair their barrels. No new oak, it's just more so to impart a really nice structure of the wines that are aged in there before they go into blending. And then additionally to that, um, that oxidative style, which encourages some more uh, interaction with that, with that oxygen, is there, the other main reason that Special Cuvée is unique is their use of reserve wines. So if you look behind me, my photo is a um, kind of a snapshot of one of the outcroppings of the caves in Bollinger. And these are magnums that are laying in wait um, in their miles of caves under the winery. At any given time, there are 700,000 magnums aging in the caves at Bollinger, ranging in age from two to 15 years. They're separated by vintage varietal village with each parcel representing a unique characteristic to add to the blend. And you can imagine a master painter with 700,000 colors. So the winemaker can use what he feels will add that touch of apple or white flower or structure in crafting the blend. And once he has made his final blending decision, the wine is aged, um, the blended wine is aged for nearly four years on the lees to help impart additional layers of added complexity. And this aging creates the complement of both texture and creaminess to balance out those really bright citrus and lip smacking um, acidity in the wine. So I guess the main question is why do they put all of this time and effort into creating such a labor of love? Um, mainly because it's part of their history of quality and they have a legacy to protect for centuries to come. It was the first champagne to receive the royal warrant by the English crown. So if you look at the bottle, it's the little crown symbol there. 
and it has been the champagne of choice for James Bond for 40 years. So I'm hoping that if it's good enough for a queen and for a secret agent, hopefully it will delight you as well. I, I would say this champagne has a license to be a killer champagne. <laughs> Terry, it certainly, it certainly does. Um, the, the oxygen, as I mentioned with the kind of oxidative style, it really lends a little bit more of a nutty character to the wine in addition to kind of the rich, round, broad-shouldered style. So this is a really nice kind of juxtaposition um, with Moet and Hennessy, it's more of the kind of reductive bright style. Ours is a little bit more of that kind of big brooding, um, you know, more hefty style of champagne where you get a little bit more of that golden apple um, and fruit that uh, definitely I would consider it a heavyweight in, in terms of weight class. <laughs> I can't disagree. Oh man, I've got to have all four of these champagnes. Hopefully everyone watching has had a chance to try them too and I am outstandingly happy. Uh, now, let's move into the intermission. We'll take a little break between champagnes. Uh, I want to let everyone know, stick around till the end. We have a super secret mega special deal that's going to be announced at the very end of the showdown. After we've made all our decisions, we have an excellent coupon. It's going to go live later today. But for our intermission, I want to talk about downtown spirits for a minute. We have our wine sorcerer program. We have twice monthly wine classes led by certified instructor Stephen Brown. You can see him right there on the screen. Uh, it takes you on a tour of old world, new world, reds, whites, everything in between. Uh, he is uh, very knowledgeable. I've learned many things from listening to him talk about wine. Uh, if you join the wine sorcerer class now, you can receive either six or three bottle course packs monthly and follow along with our amazing curriculum. All right. So next up will be the Good Cocktail Company. It's a brief word from our sponsor today, uh, coming to us all the way from Auckland, New Zealand, to tell us how their product can make a fun champagne topper. So welcome, Jamie. Can you tell us about the Good Cocktail Company mixers? Hi. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I'm actually outside here in um, in our office in central Auckland. Um, not quite sure what the weather's doing, so um, we tend to get quite a bit of rain, but I think we're going to be okay for the for the moment. So um, here in New Zealand, we've crafted um, our all natural, alcohol free um, cocktail mixers, um, and we're really proud of these. They are a, a twist on a classic. Uh, cocktail. So we've got uh, our mojito, which has got um, icy mint in it and real lime juice. And so the idea of these is that they are all from um, from the name fruit um, botanical extracts. Um, there's not, no preservatives in them. They are gluten free and vegan. Um, so we have our mojito with icy mint. We've got our margarita with real hibiscus flower. So taste of the South Pacific. And we've also got a Cosmo with real cranberry and sweet orange. And just as a little reveal for the future, although it's not on the sheet, we have a daiquiri with yuzu and boysenberry that we've just brought out down here in New Zealand and Australia. So I'm really very, very honored to be here um, learning about these amazing champagne houses um, and um, to be included in today. And I just wanna say um, kia ora from New Zealand and um, everybody, kia ka, take care of yourself, stay safe, and thank you so much for being able to present these today. Ah, thanks so much. I love the mixers. Um, we had our intermission pack. My recommendation would be the Wolf Burger Cremant Alsace that we have, um, and I like the margarita myself personally. Just a little bit of bubbly in there is a delightful brunch treat. But that said, so we've had our brutes, kind of the general style that everyone thinks of when they have champagne. Now we're moving on to kind of the other styles. We're going to start with rosé. Now, Brittany let us out of the first set, and she's going to introduce us to the second set with Ayala Rosé. Brittany, um, I want to talk about uh, the history of the region. I mean, I think it's fascinating how, or how the world wars kind of we're right there in Champagne. And how did the sellers survive that? 
that sort of era of just intense chaos? A great question, Terry. Um, the the long and short of it is they almost didn't. Um, sometimes it's easy to kind of forget that the Champagne region really served as the front line for bro both world wars, and many families during that time had to be incredibly innovative and resourceful in order to keep their wineries going. Um, for example, for Ayala, they have almost two miles of tunnels and caves under the vineyards and winery in the village of Ai. And during the Nazi occupation, the family, while they hid their most precious wines behind false walls in, in those caves, their winery above ground was actually occupied. And when the Germans ultimately retreated, they left Ayala an IOU note for 700 bottles of wine that they consumed while they occupied the winery. And that notice is still housed in the historical ar archives of the house. The house itself was established in 1860, so they've um, had quite quite a historic run uh, in, in the village. And along with Laurent Perrier, uh, Ayala is one of the first houses to pioneer that style of low dosage. At the time, as Naomi mentioned, it was very fashionable for champagne to be very sweet, um, but Ayala really wanted to have the focus be on the purity of the fruits and really make that the star and use smaller amounts of sugar in their wines. And this led them to both international acclaim and also to be the drink of choice in both the English and Spanish royal courts at the uh, end of the 19th century. Today, they continue uh, to innovate with an incredibly young and dynamic team. They have the youngest GM in all of Champagne currently. Um, and Carolyn Latrieve is one of only a handful of female winemakers or chef de cabs as they are called. And her specialty is Chardonnay. Uh, Chardonnay has always provided the building blocks for Ayala's house style, as the vineyard holdings are in the Cote de Blanc, or Hills of White. You can actually see I've gone from Bollinger's Caves out into Ayala's vineyards. So imagine the cliffs of Dover. Um, that same chalk basin that you can kind of see right above here um, actually extends all the way into Champagne, into the Cote de Blanc, and gives the name to the hills in that region. And the Chardonnay that comes from there expresses amazing minerality, depth and precision in the resulting champagne. And in order to preserve these characteristics, everything at Ayala is fermented in stainless steel. In addition to that, for the reserve wines, they don't want anything older than two years. They want everything vibrant and fresh. Um, and I feel like it's really exemplified in their wines, but also especially um, in their rosé. All right. Um, uh, oh, sorry, go for it, Terry. Fire away. I, you know what? I thought I'd have a question for you, but I, I'm just, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> well, to give you a little, a little rundown, kind of true to their heritage, they've continued this low dosage style to showcase the fruit and vibrancy with their, their Brut Rosé. This wine is right around eight grams per liter, and it's 51% Chardonnay, 40% Pinot Noir, and 9% Pinot Meunier. And what the Pinot Noir does in this wine is lends a really lovely note of fresh red fruit, and it gives a really lovely subtle pink hue to the wine. Um, any complexity that you really find, a little bit of more of that kind of um, doughy, freshly baked bread note comes from being aged for 36 months on the leaves. So really kind of helps um, counteract that really vibrant acidity from the Chardonnay. A lot of leaves. Yeah, it's got a wonderful balance of richness and freshness. All right, Jory, let's get into some Foyat Rosé. Um, so, I mean, Foyat is the youngest house we're tasting. How do you think its youth affects the, the winemaking style and the champagnes that it's putting out? Well, I think we can all collaborati collaboratively agree these two champagnes are incredibly different. Um, you know, going back to what I was talking about before in the youth and the conception of Nicholas Foyat is relatively new. And it does play a lot into the more modern style, you know, with the diversity and the quality of fruit, um, but also some of the processes that are utilized uh, in, the, in the winemaking and fermentation process. Um, <laughs> in just, uh, so yeah, 45 years, uh, 30 acres of, land that Nicholas Foyot originally purchased turned into uh, a cooper uh, cooperation of 5,000 different growers. 
uh, in which a hundred of those growers um, are utilized in this bottle of champagne. Uh, this is a grower owned champagne house and in 2020 was named the wine growers group of the year by the revenue de Vin la France and all the profits benefit the growers uh, directly to help maintain their vineyards and uh, basically ensure that we'll have more quality fruit in years to come. Um, so with this particular champagne, uh, you know, definitely a more bold flavor profile, uh, fruit forward, you know, if we're going back to the Hollywood theme, let's, let's consider it maybe a Sophia Loren, uh, rounded, uh, definitely a little bit more rich. And this style, you know, comes from a process, um, uh, extended maceration where there's more of that skin contact uh, in the uh, with the grapes so clearly you see a very vibrant color uh, but also um, what you see is a whole cluster of fermentation so just to break it down a little bit you take the full berries and you ferment them with uh, a small inclusion of the leaves and the stems. And this is actually a very traditional technique, but it's utilized less frequently now because it's, it's risky. Uh, because if you operate it incorrectly, you get a very austere, uh, very out of balance, a little bit of a green note uh, to the flavor of the wine. But if it's done correctly, you get additional structure you get a rounded fruit forward style. And this is exactly what this wine is. And, uh, you know, it was interesting listening to Brittany talk because as you were describing your wine, these are so completely different. And I think that's the beauty of this, uh, this, this event is to, is to look at the different styles. Um, you mentioned lower dosage, and this is, a, this is a higher dosage. And that's to balance out uh, the weight of the wine and uh, in some of that uh, fermentation process where you have additional tannin, uh, a little bit additional sugar as well to balance out the flavors. Um, so this is also driven by Pinot Noir again with 60% and uh, uh, definitely uh, again there's no oak utilized on this so there is still a freshness but the, definitely an underlying power as well. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this one too. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm with you. It's definitely like Sophia Loren, Mar yeah, Marilyn Monroe right there. She packs a punch. <laughs> yeah, just wonderful. All right, so those were the rosés. Now we're moving on to our final match. They're gonna be the Sweeties. And we're gonna start off the demi-sex with Laurent Perrier and Naomi. Um, <clears throat> demi-sex is kind of an interesting style, I think. Sweet wines have definitely gone out of fashion recently. Um, but I'm so happy that uh, so many people got the demi sex to try. Um, yeah, I mean, what do you think about um, demi sec? Like, well, I'm going to tell you a little secret, actually, not to cut you off, but um, you know, I, I've been in the champagne business for a long time. And <laughs> If you take a, a blind tasting and you pour a demi sec for anyone, I'm can, I'm going to tell you they're going to love it. And when people don't hear the term demi sec and they taste the wine, they're not jaded. And I think that that's a reflection of, of the fact that there's a lot of really bad demi sec out there. And I'll say that um, a lot of houses have used the demi sec category as a way to use wine that they don't wanna put in their mainstream champagnes. And then they kind of doctor it up with a little sugar and sugar has this amazing power to correct a lot of flaws and voila, you have a sellable item. But truth be told, um, this, this demi-sec that you guys have is actually very similar to the La Cuvée that you had, but with a heavier dosage. So we actually, we own Laurent Perrier, Salon, Delmont. Um, we have a couple other small houses, one that's mainly for like the Castellon, which is like a the house, the labeled um, house flying for Marks and Spencer. It's like very small. Um, but then we do sell off stuff that we're not using. We don't have to put that not so great wine into this bottle. This is 
pristine, delicious Grand Cru and Premier Cru fruit. So what you're tasting is more of a sweet tart, very high quality wine. It's very balanced, it's light. Um, I teach a lot of uh, like food and wine classes. I teach at the Chief School of San Francisco regularly, or I was doing that, now I'm doing all these virtual classes, but I can tell you there's not one cheese that would not taste absolutely delicious with this demi sec. Taking it even further, take it, pick a pick your favorite food. You want um, well, uh, well, Asian food, Indian food, whatnot. This wine is going to taste great with it. So it's a great compliment in terms of just flavor additions. Well, what's your what's your favorite cheese to go with a demi sec? With the demi sec, I love blue cheese. So I love um, I love Roquefort. I think Roquefort and and demi. But I have to say that de blue cheese can be very polarizing. Um, so uh, not everybody is a big blue cheese fan. So I would say um, like a nice aged cheddar, maybe something um, you know uh, Beecher's um, like their standard cheddar would go great with this. Um, but really, I mean any any cheese you can pick, any your favorite. Um, I'm trying to think of some great Washington state produced cheeses, but you, you pick one and it's gonna go great with it. I would say Roquefort Papillon is probably my favorite cheese pairing across my, my career that I've ever had. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, yeah, it's hard to beat the legend, right? <laughs> All right. And now for the last wine, so Nancy graciously guide us through the Veuve Clicquot Demi Sec. Nancy. <laughs> yes, so we can't talk about Veuve Clicquot Demi Sec without touching upon Madame Clicquot a little bit. Uh, Veuve Clicquot was a widow. She lost her husband at the age of 27. And although she came from a wealthy merchant family and married into a wealthy mer merchant family, <clears throat> excuse me, she did something pretty audacious. She decided to take over the winery after her husband's passing and really built it into an international success. Some of the terms that we saw earlier in the afternoon about riddling, um, she figured if her customers were the kings and queens of England and the czars of Russia, they better be drinking a pristine, beautiful and clear product. So she famously took her kitchen table, asked them to lean it up against the wall and drilled holes so that the bottle of champagne could be tilted at an angle so that the leaves that it was aged on could be filtered down closer to the cap and be disgorged. Um, we just talked about Rosé. She also was the first on record to um, do an assemblage style of Rosé, meaning blending a red wine into a white wine to make a pink wine. Um, she also created the very first vintage. She was a superstitious woman. There was a comet that passed over Champagne in 1811, and that gave her the, the feeling that that one year should be captured and declared its own vintage. So pretty awesome lady. Um, she also didn't pass down the business to her only daughter. Uh, she passed it down to a very astute German immigrant who worked alongside her in the vineyards, paid very close attention to the quality of the fruit. And she felt that this dedication to quality in the vineyards was the legacy of what's in the bottle that she wanted to pass on. So a lot like Laurent Perrier, while some demi-sec houses are kind of, it's a product as an afterthought, the demi-sec that Clicquot produces is very similar to the yellow label, which we did not taste today, but um, like Bollinger, it's a more oxidative, barrel aged, full bodied style of wine driven by Pinot Noir. It's about 50, 45 to 50% Pinot Noir. Um, the amount of reserve wine is pretty, normal for a high quality champagne around 30 percent for non-vintage but what makes the reserve wine unique is that the age of the reserve wines are about nine to ten years old so when you're tasting this demi sec it's not just a delicate hint a kiss of sweetness but there's a layer and there's a complexity to it that gives it i would, I would say it's a demi sec that lends itself that you could even pair it with more savory foods as well um i'm a big holiday ham person so one of my favorite uh, favorite savory pairings is with uh, Christmas ham, um, but certainly cheeses are great. You can even do spicy foods as well. Um, it could be a nice addition to a Taco Tuesday meal or even pizza, like with a spicy pepperoni as well. So, I will say, yeah, uh, semi-sweet wines with spicy food is an unreal pairing. Even though it sounds like it might not work, when you actually put the two together, my boy. Uh, 
I tell you, I would I would love to have this with some vindaloo right now. Yeah, good call. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> well, uh, thanks so much. Uh, this was awesome. So I wanted to thank all of the ladies who joined us today for the tasting and for sharing their time and their expertise. Um, so Naomi, Nancy, Brittany, Jory, thank you so much for being here. I love working with you guys and I love the champagnes that you give me and force me to drink. Um, we love working with you too, Terry. <laughs> tough job, but so someone's gotta do us. all the champagne drinking. Exactly. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been really fun. Thank you for everybody for joining as well. Absolutely. Cheers. Hopefully you found some ones that you really gravitate toward and love as much as we do. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Here, here. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> okay, so there we have it. And now it's all on you. Toughest question of all, which wines won your hearts? And let's put up that voting slide. So there's the battles, four battles, four winners. <laughs> All right, go ahead. There should be a vote popping up in the chat right now. Take a minute and uh, pick your favorites, and then we'll go ahead and see what the results are. Uh, and while we're doing the voting, uh, let me go ahead and... All right. Let me go ahead and be quiet for a second, let you think. I'm feeling kind of nervous. <laughs> Let's talk about what our New Year's Eve plans are given it's such a traditional champagne holiday well, ladies terry what are you guys planning on doing for new year's this year oh sleeping <laughs> on, I, this vintage champagne that just came out i don't want to say the name of it but i'm planning on popping that on uh, new year's eve after i get off from i'm working at the best store in <laughs> Anyone else have any plans yet? You know, I had a couple events uh, lined up that may just turn virtual like this. So who knows? You know, maybe we'll be hanging out with some of you guys again. <laughs> exactly. No, I think ladies, you should take this on the road. I'm just saying, this has been so fun. Let's make this thing happen again. <laughs> it has. I loved hearing everyone's stories. Me too. I learned some stuff today. This has been great. I did too. It's wonderful to taste everybody else's wines too. It's um. It's, it's been a pleasure, ladies. Thank you. I also don't think I've been as excited for New Year's in pajamas and champagne as much as I am for this year. So That's wonderful. <laughs> That's the nice thing about champagne is it pairs with literally everything. And mm -hmm. it doesn't have to pair with anything because it's great just by itself. You know, I mean... I, I, I think we were talking earlier and um, before everyone signed on about how through this pandemic, champagne sales with the retail sector have been incredible. Like the category in general is up about 60% right now. And what that says to me is that in these tough times, people are turning to champagne. They're elevating their drinking experience and getting happiness out of champagne. And I know personally, I, I do this on a pretty regular basis. Like my favorite example is like, it's raining. I have to clean my house. I open up a bottle of champagne. I've elevated it. Like it really truly is like nothing else in the whole world where you can do that. And I think people are finding that with the pandemic and kind of makes me feel good about my chosen path. <laughs> a glass of champagne is also known as self-care these days. So exactly. make sure you treat yourself and pat yourself on the back between virtual <laughs> school, <laughs> Shut down. I mean, it's been a year. I always said champagne and sweatpants were my favorite pairing. Yes. Yes. But, uh, Match made in heaven. Exactly. That, show us the results of the uh, the voting. Oh, Laurent Perrier took the lead for the first route. Let's see. I was pretty neck and neck for the second. But uh, Moet just squeaked out a win by one vote over Bollinger. 
Sorry, James Bond. So close. So close. That was super close. <laughs> and uh, I was, it was pretty close for the Rosés. Viola. I must do, Brittany. <laughs> and again, the one vote difference for the demi sec. The Laurent Perrier took over the Vauve Clicquot. I gotta so, say, I love that Vauve Clicquot demi sec. I actually, I, we, we did a blind tasting with my, my company, by the way, our, our small, like 15 team for the US. And we all thought that the Vauve Clicquot was so delicious. It, it was, we also, I think we came in about the same way. So. <laughs> They're both delicious. I used to pour Laurent Perrier demi sec at the place I worked at and it's one of my favorite demis. Well. I think uh, Naomi won two out of four. It seems like she has the bragging rights for this. Uh. <laughs> well done. Well Hi, done. Naomi. Well deserved. Congrats. <laughs> In your champagnes for the rest of the afternoon. That's just what I'm going to do. So that's how I'm going to celebrate. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks ladies. Thanks on you next time. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, no, thank you so much. I loved every bottle that I opened. I've uh, rarely met a champagne I didn't like. So this has been amazing. I want to thank everyone who joined us on the Zoom call. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Uh, certainly as much fun as, as all of the uh, wonderful women of Champagne had with us. Um, so there we go. The showdown has been shown down. And now um, I just want to talk about downtown spirits for a minute. Let's move on to our super special co-op program. Uh, so this is uh, a great program that we uh, recently initiated here at Downtown Spirit. It's called the co-op. Um, you get unlimited free delivery within zone one and two, which covers most of Seattle. Um, part of it, you get 15% off over 200 uh, labeled co-op items. So just, you know, specific spirits and wine that are labeled on our website as co-op get you a bonus discount and then 5% off everything else. And in addition to all of that, you also get exclusive access to limited releases. So I get calls every day looking for those ultra limited uh, Japanese whiskeys or bourbons, and those will only be available to members of our co-op. Um, so go ahead, sign up today. I highly recommend it. I think it's one of the greatest programs in the history of programs. And now let's move on to the coupon that I promised you earlier. It's a super secret discount code, which is online only. And the code is showdown. So go ahead. If you like any of the champagnes that you've tasted today, all of the 750s are on sale with this particular coupon code. Pop on the website, buy your favorites. I think we all know which ones our favorites were because I told you to write them down and then you put them in a vote. So enjoy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Downtown Spirits, from me, from all of the, uh, the women who, you know, work the best jobs in the world. Thanks so much for joining us. All right. <laughs> Thanks again, Terry, and thank you guys. You guys are awesome. Really fun. <laughs> it was right. fun sharing the day with you. Okay. Super Thanks. fun. Super fun. Likewise. You guys, you guys had a good event. 
It was so fun. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so much. When we can all get to it, let's grab a glass of bubbles together and uh, cheers to the winners. <laughs> yeah, that would be, I, I would love that. Um, I think we did a really great job in terms of selection because I feel like anytime things are split so evenly 50-50, it's a really great kind of comparison to show stylistic differences. So super cool. Great job. Yeah, and honestly, you guys all did an awesome job. It was so great to hear your guys's you sharing about your houses. And I really did. I learned a lot today. So well done. I think you, I, everyone did such a great job. Likewise. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I just but I want to hear more. There were so many parts where I'm like, <laughs> wait, okay. So <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I'm taking myself for a nap, buying the pack ahead of time to taste along with everyone. So yeah. I've had a lot of Laurent Perry in my day. Well, thank um, you. I've been very fortunate that. to work at a champagne bar. Previously, I was a buyer there. Where did you work um, before? Popped for champagne. Oh, stop it in Chicago. I love yeah. that place. Wow. So, wow. How long have you been in Seattle? Um, five, five weeks. Okay. Whoa. Five weeks. Welcome. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm you brand new. Oh, and now you're getting the rain. I love it. That is awesome. I've also had a lot of Bollinger in my day too. So the Bollinger is so good. We don't see as much Nicolas Fouya out in the Chicago market. It's been growing, I would say the last yeah. significantly, I would say more so in the last two or three years. Um, and I've had it, but I can't say I've had as much of it. Whereas I may have fallen asleep with a glass of Bollinger in my hand before. <laughs> you're, in, you're in good company Never. you're in good company <laughs> well hey terry i don't know if you guys i know you have your person who does wine education but maybe that's something to consider for 2021 is to do more of a, a larger scale maybe academic kind of approach and you kind of highlight some of these champagne houses and maybe you just narrow it down but obviously there's a ton of information and Champagne is always going to be interesting. So something you might want to consider for the future. And I think we would all be interested in um, doing something um, again together. I, Absolutely. Yeah, pointed out champagne's on fire right now. I can't keep enough of it in stock. So I think, yeah, it'd be fantastic. People love champagne and then they can know champagne. <laughs> yep. Definitely. <laughs> Well, thank you guys. Terry, unless you need uh, us to debrief any further or have any other questions, I might pop off and grab myself another glass. <laughs> you guys have champagne in front of you. Go on, put on your sweatpants by my recommendation. <laughs> and just, thanks so much for coming here today. This was great. I Absolutely. Really have a great rest of your thank weekend, you ladies and gents. Me too. Me too. Bye. Happy holidays. You guys have yeah, a wonderful happy holidays. year. I hope you guys have lots of sales. I hope you enjoy yourselves. Have a wonderful Christmas, New Year's, everything. And uh, cheers to you guys.